This program is rated adults only. It contains language that may offend and violence that may disturb some people. With its breathtaking scenery, superb climate and relaxed way of life, Nelson is one of New Zealand's most popular holiday spots. It's also known as one of the country's safest cities. But on Saturday the 1st of May 1993, devoted father Kevin O'Loughlin came face to face with the dark side of Sonny Nelson. Devastated by the recent breakdown of his relationship, Kevin decided to drown his sorrows on a pub crawl in Nelson. As the night drew to a close, the 30-year-old builder took a shortcut through a city car park. Kevin was ambushed from behind and stabbed six times in the back and chest. He staggered to the main road and keeled over on the footpath. Passers-by thought he was a comatose drunk. In fact, Kevin was dead. The vicious execution-style killing of Kevin O'Loughlin stunned his family and friends and shocked the wider Nelson community. Police could find no reason why anyone would want to murder the hard-working family man. Despite a massive police investigation, the killers of Kevin O'Loughlin have never been caught. Tonight, two gifted psychics will lead a team of investigators in a hunt for new clues in Nelson's only unsolved murder case. He's had a few drinks, he's come out, he's thinking maybe I'll just walk home. He's saying that he was pretty much out on his own, really, so he was having a good time, though. Just wanted to get sloshed and just try and wash his blues away. Every time I look at him, he falls down. Multiple stab wounds, I could see it. I uh, went through his lung and severed an artery in one of the main arteries. The strike zone was just bang, gone. Thanks very much for coming. Just knocks the feet from under you. He said to me, I love you too, Mother, and I always will. Last time. This is where Kevin's body was found. Sort of round about, about here. I'd just seen him prior to that, and here he was staying there. He's actually showing me blood. Like, like I'm standing in the pool of it, it feels like. When they pulled the sheet back, his eyes were still open, looking up at me. They took my mother away from me. I never got to know him. Kevin James O'Loughlin was born on the 14th of January 1963 in the picturesque lakeside town of Tianao on the southwest coast of New Zealand. Kevin was born in the Lumsden Maternity Home and raised him up the valley at Nobbs Flat. He loved his school, yes, and the teachers loved Kevin. And they used to say, see, we didn't need to help him with his homework because he'd do his homework. He was always a forward boy. When he was growing up, he was always the, the, like the boss. The second youngest of four brothers, Kevin had a rough and tumble country childhood. They all had their fights. I'd be holding them apart and they couldn't, hitting my hands to get it off their jersey so they can punch the other one. And I hung on and Kevin turned around and said to one of his mates, he said, God, Mum's got a hold on that hand of hers. He never stood down. He always stood up for himself. He wouldn't back down. If he said something, he'd stick with it. Kevin was popular at school, but was particularly close to his best mate. His friend Trevor was born on the same day as Kevin. And from there on, they went to school and went here, there and everywhere together. I think he's so tough trying to hang out with us. He got wasted, he's like, ugh. And when they grew up, they played football together and got into trouble and got out of trouble, like boys do. Kevin left school at 15 after getting his school certificate and started a building apprenticeship. He said, I always wanted to be a mechanic, but mum said I have to be a carpenter, so a carpenter he was. And Kevin said, when they'd all gone out, he said, Mother, i do it for you. Kevin always knew how to sweet-talk the ladies. He fathered his first child to a woman he met while studying at Polytech in Invercargill. When he moved back to Tianao, Kevin married a local hairdresser, Marie. The newlyweds agreed to delay having children for five years. I said, well, that's a good idea because while you're both with no family, 
it's a good time to go overseas and travel. Five months after she tells me I haven't taken the pill for five months, I said, but what if you have a baby? I don't care, she said. So when Kevin found out about that baby, he picked up hold all, walked out and never came back. Went down to Lumsden, that's where he met Leanne. He's a very handsome guy, very, very handsome. He's tall, he was muscular, um, um, and very intelligent. He was a very intelligent man. Kevin's parents were strict Catholics and disapproved of his relationship with Leanne. He brought her up here one night because he was talking to his father. And I went over to her and I says, a pretty girl like you, she was a married woman herself with two children. Going around with my son, I said, it'll all come to grief, you know. And I gave him a smack. And he grabbed my wrist. And his father said, you let your mother go. <laughs> you did well, that, that's the dumbest one ever, eh? By now, Kevin had fathered two children to two different women, but he had little to do with raising them. When it came to his new relationship, though, Kevin was every bit the family man and doted on Leanne and her two children. Oh, he would take us for drives, took the kids and myself around the South Island, I said to him, Nelson looks beautiful. I love driving around the bay. I said, I'd love to move here. As a surprise for Leanne, Kevin applied for a job in Nelson. And within three weeks, the family shifted north. They settled in the Nelson suburb of Stoke and Kevin's hard work ethic soon impressed his new bosses. Kevin was a fantastic builder. We were in Nelson a very short while and he was made foreman of the job site that he was doing. Kevin and Leanne loved the layback Nelson lifestyle, and before long, they were welcoming a new addition to their family. When Hayley was born, she was the apple of his eye. He would insist on pushing the pram, um, loved her, loved her to pieces. And it was like, it was his little bundle of joy, and he just absolutely adored it. Eventually, he would have liked to have built a new, new home for us, I would say he probably would have wanted more children, probably a son. Five months before he died, Kevin tried to heal the rift with his parents. So he came for the Christmas with me and he'd come down in the morning, he says, oh, takes Leanne a whole hour to put her face on. And I'd turn away and I'd say, mumble to myself and say, well, that's what you wanted, that's what you've got, you know. And when he'd all packed and sat all the children and saw that they had their seat belts on, he'd come to give me a cuddle. I said, I love you, son. He said to me, I love you too, mother, and I always will. The last time, five months. What the fuck are you doing? What are you doing with us? Back in Nelson, trouble was brewing in paradise. Kevin sometimes worked seven days a week, but being the sole breadwinner and raising three young children was taking its toll. The family was strapped for cash, and Kevin became more short-tempered at work, at play, and at home. Leanne saw another side to Kevin, one that would fly off the handle for no reason. He could become quite jealous. I mean in the respect that if, um, I spoke to someone, it was an issue. Leanne found it increasingly difficult to cope with Kevin's aggressive outbursts. Ten weeks before Kevin died, the couple separated. I can't say how long it would have taken, but I do believe we would have been back together. But any hope of reconciliation was brutally robbed from the young couple on a May night in 1993. Next, police delve into Kevin's past to try and determine a motive for murder. And Kevin's daughter struggles to cope with her loss. It hits you hard as you get older. On weekends, the streets of Nelson are buzzing with pub crawling locals and tourists. The atmosphere is usually friendly, and even after dark, the city streets are considered safe. 
So when Kevin O'Loughlin joined the partying masses, he had no reason to suspect he'd be in danger. Kevin had gone into town on um, Saturday night about 8pm, which was the 1st of May 1993. Nelson police profiled Kevin and discovered that while he had no criminal record or gang connections, he was prone to spontaneous aggressive outbursts and was handy with his fists. He wasn't a person to step down. Uh, he liked uh, the odd drink. Probably what you call, you know, a person that's hard and uh, fear. Play a bit of squash, sir. Kevin had always been popular with women, and when he went out that fateful night, it's possible he was looking for love to nurse his broken heart. Tommy, another drink bro, for the lady. Oh, I think that uh, he became depressed as a result of um, the split up. At the, at the time, and uh, I think the night he was out drinking was the first time he'd been out for a while. It was rumoured that Kevin had made a date that night with a married woman, which fell through when her husband found out. Kevin ended up going out alone, but soon joined up with some acquaintances. We came into town and Kevin met up with us and we had a drink in the Wakatoo and then we just moved on to other pubs. There was me well, myself and a friend of mine, Dallas. And um, yeah, we just moved on from pub to pub and Kevin came with us. Dallas and I walked over to the Southern Cross Bar, which is now Taylor's. The front part of it was called Toby Jug. And we stayed there for an hour or so. And then he moved across the road to the Waka 2, <laughs> to the Royal Hotel. Back to Walker 2, down to the Toby Jug. We moved on again to Horatio's. Horatio's was one of Nelson's most popular nightclubs and a well-known pickup joint. Kevin spent an hour strutting his stuff on the dance floor. It was rumoured his antics may have caused some of the punters to give him the evil eye. As three o'clock approached, Kevin found himself broke and alone. His newfound friends, Paula and Dallas, had already taken a taxi to the nearby officer's club. Kevin told them he'd make his own way there. We left Horatio's and it should have taken him all of five minutes to walk from Horatio's to the officer's club. And yeah, that was the last time we saw him. Kevin left Horatio's on his own. He'd been drinking since 8pm, but his alcohol levels were not excessive and police don't believe he was rolling drunk. Kevin was seen outside uh, Horatio's nightclub about 2.50 a.m. that morning. He's walked towards the service station across the road, through the alleyway there. He's gone through the bus depot, on towards Bridge Street, through an alleyway into the Montgomery car park. It was to be Kevin's final journey. As he headed towards the main street, Kevin was ambushed from behind and viciously stabbed to death. He managed to stagger onto Hardy Street before collapsing in a pool of blood outside the Dick Smith electronics shop. Yeah, 42 to base. It looks like we've got a uh, fatality here. Um, can you radio to the police immediately? A couple of persons um, just after three o'clock had actually seen Kevin's body on the ground. They just carried on walking, thinking he was a drunk, un unconscious. This is where Kevin's body was found, round about... sort of round about... about here, if I can remember properly, down here. He was laying down here. When Kevin's friend Dallas stumbled onto the gruesome scene, he soon realised it was serious. I don't know. Minutes later, Paula emerged from the officers' club. No, Paula! When I come out, it was just such a shock to see him actually laying there, you know, when I'd just been with him prior to that. Five, ten minutes earlier, I'd been with him. Kevin's official cause of death was as a result of a stab wound to his back, uh, went through his lung and severed an artery. There was blood splatters on the wall and then the blood trail goes where he was found. And he'd also been uh, hit in the back of his head with a blunt instrument, which tends, please, to suggest there was at least two persons who were involved in the attack on him. When they pulled the sheet back, 
his eyes were still open, looking up at me. You know, I remember thinking, he's not dead. I just, you just, it, it doesn't sink in. I remember thinking, he's not dead, he's, he's alive, and in a moment, he's going to talk to me. Well, it's not easy telling children something like that, telling children that their father's gone. Um, I was pretty much honest with them. I told them they had a lot of questions. I told them exactly what had happened. I wanted to know who did it and how it was done. Well, when Leanne phoned me, she said, I hope you're sitting down. I said, well, what? What is it? She said, Kevin's dead, just like that. Just knocks the feet from under you. Just hours later, Kevin's parents were dealt another blow. In a tragic coincidence, Kevin's best mate had died in a car crash on the same day. Later that afternoon, we heard about Trevor. And he was in a Land Rover. The Land Rover tipped over. He, he was folded over, bent over, and they reckon he just couldn't breathe. Unbelievably, Kevin and his best mate were born on the same day and died on the same day. They had a joint funeral and were buried side by side in a cemetery in their hometown of Tianao. The following day, Kevin's dad, Terry, turned 60. Because I had the cake made and everything was a surprise, a couple of people from the Ming Garden here came, you know, to pay their respects. And I said to Mary, I was having Terence's 60th party tomorrow, but I'm not going to have it now. She said, you will hold that party and we'll cater free for 30 people. And his two brothers have never eaten Chinese food. They don't believe in it. They were fair filling their plates and heating it up in the microwave. They loved that food. It's been over a decade, but Kevin's friends and family are still traumatised by his brutal slaying. Somebody will talk about it, someone will contact you, um, and it takes you right back to 13 years ago when it happened. And it's almost like it was yesterday. Kevin and Leanne's daughter, Hayley, was just two when her father was murdered. When I was little, it did take a bit for me to realise that I didn't have a father anymore. It didn't really affect me until like, I started getting older. And, um, not knowing that I didn't have a real father. And he, he was gone. Kevin was murdered near a main street, and police believe the attack could have lasted for up to 45 seconds. Police searched for witnesses among the hundreds of partygoers out in Nelson that night. Dick Smith Electronic used to be here, and it was quite a bright area, like it was really well lit, and the bakery was across the road, and they had people working in there at the time because it was you know early in the morning and um but nobody seemed to have seen anything police described kevin's murder as an execution style killing performed clinically and with precision the murder weapon was believed to be an extremely sharp knife a number of people have come forward who have found knives in the central business area who have said it may have been related but those knives have not led us anywhere Kevin was six foot two and weighed 93 kilograms. He was strong and fit and knew how to defend himself. Police are fairly certain more than one person was involved in the attack. Kevin's family agrees. I believe it's somebody that knew him. If a stranger came up to him, he would fight back. Um, if it was somebody that he knew, chances are he may not. It wouldn't be one person because Kevin was pretty good with his dukes and the fella would have to be pretty quick to cop him. Police felt that the viciousness of the attack indicated malice and the killer was more likely to have been someone with a prior motive. However, they couldn't rule out the possibility that the murder was entirely random or spurred by a minor confrontation earlier in the night. Because of the personality he had, he could and he did upset a lot of people. To our knowledge, Kevin had no enemies that we know of but he was a stand-up top guy and he may have had arguments over, over months, but there was no enemy, so to speak, that we know of. Police have still not been able to determine why Kevin's killers wanted him dead. Over the years, they've interviewed 2,000 people and have closely investigated over 100 people of interest. 
But thanks to a recent scientific breakthrough, they're hoping DNA samples collected at the crime scene will eventually lead to an arrest. Well, 1993, the DNA was, was not as advanced as it has been. The last 10 years, we've made quantum leaps, and in 2005, a DNA profile was obtained. And our job now is to match that DNA profile with a person of interest. Police are still working through that process, but attempts to match the DNA have so far been unsuccessful. Next, two gifted psychics will ask the spirit of Kevin O'Loughlin to provide them with clues that could reveal the identity of his killers and provide police with new suspects. So you've had a bit of a smooch with the ladies. Mm. He could get angry if he needed to get angry. He could fight if he wanted to fight like he's given me that strength like I am a man. TV. Kevin O'Loughlin was just 30 years old and in the prime of his life when he was stabbed to death after a night out on the town. For over a decade, his killers have evaded capture. Now, two psychics will lead investigators in a search for new clues. Using their remarkable gifts, they will retrace Kevin's last steps and hunt for his killers. To assist in the Kevin O'Loughlin murder inquiry, a New Zealand and an Australian psychic have been selected. 75 psychics from across New Zealand were tested. A little known solved murder was chosen for the testing procedure. Presented with only a photograph of the victim, the psychics were asked to produce details of the crime, the location and the killer. Of the 75 psychics tested, only three were able to describe intimate details of the case. One of these New Zealand psychics, Kelvin Crookshank, has been chosen to investigate the Kevin O'Loughlin murder. Kelvin works full-time as a psychic medium, doing personal readings, psychic development workshops and live shows. We're just asking um, Spirit uh, if it's OK for us to commun can communicate with him, if it's OK to um, be safe and protected and asking for positive vibrations only. 100 Australian psychics were also tested. One of these, Deb Webber, will assist in the Kevin O'Loughlin inquiry. Deb works actively with Australian police on missing person and murder inquiries. It can be a scent that comes through, a feeling in the body, like I said, like a physical feeling, not just an emotional feeling, so it's all different ways that the souls like to communicate. The psychics are told that they are working on an unsolved murder, but they are not given any details of the case or the people involved. The psychics do not know the location of the case in advance and are only given their flight destination at the airport. Each psychic is filmed on a different day. They are kept under constant supervision to prevent them researching the case. Only correct statements are confirmed during the readings. I think the police should have used the psychics a long time ago because um, they need all the help they can get in solving the murder. In a case like this, I would be um quite happy to give anything a try if, if um, it's going to do some good. I have no uh, personal view on, on psychics. I believe they may be a tool for the police, um, but my verdict's still out on that at the moment. Psychic Deb Webber flies from Brisbane to Nelson and begins her reading in a hotel room. She is offered a photo of Kevin, but chooses not to look at it. Not sure it's a, if it's a female, um, she must be quite strong because I get more a male energy with this, around this. Uh, but it's interesting how I'm thinking female only because of the skin for some reason. But the energy, oh, so I'd say, um, you know, picking up on a male. Psychic Kelvin Crookshank flies from Auckland to Nelson. He is also offered Kevin's photo, but like Deb, he chooses to keep it face down. We're going to just trust it. We have to. This gentleman, gentleman, this male figure that's standing here, he's still unsure of me. You know, he's got the energy of like a 30 year old. I think he's 30. Yeah, he must be around, yeah. Um, what, uh, he's saying, oh, you know, 29 and not. <laughs> Kevin was 30 when he was murdered. I really want to say handsome too. A uh, really good looking boy. Yeah, it's a, come on through. Not fat. I'm not getting any fat on his body, but I'm still getting like a, a muscle tone to his arms, OK? He's sort of um, swinging his body around at the moment, so he, he knows he's got a good tone. <laughs> he's, um, OK, that's nice. Um, uh, he's being rude. He's an intelligent boy too. Show me. He wants to talk to me about his tan. 
minutes. So he just says, my tan, look at my tan. And lovely skin. It's the short hair, yeah. No facial hair that I can see. I did have facial hair. He must have at some stage had a mo or something here because I keep getting hair across here, but not so much here. Good all round sort of a person, um, sporty. Um, sporty? Because they show me trophies, so sporty. Kevin loved the outdoors. He was a keen sportsman and enjoyed fishing and hunting. He could get angry if he needed to get angry. He could fight if he wanted to fight, like he's given me that strength, like I am a man, you know, tough man. And, you know, he would be quite... I, I wouldn't want to meet him in a dark corner, let's say, or an alley with his anger. Take me back about 10 years and then back a little bit further in that. So about the early 1990s, uh, 93, yeah. um, that I'm going here. Oh, he's going, oh, he's got all excited. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I think I got the year. <laughs> he's clapping. God. Deb is right. Kevin was killed in 1993. See a bit of a smoocher with the ladies. Mmm. Definitely a ladies' man, that is for certain. Definitely a guy who would just like the challenge, the chase, the thrill of the chase. He's somebody who did all right in that department. Thank you very much. <laughs> he's, um, <laughs> well, he's flirtatious, that's for sure. He's hanging out for a beer too, by the way. Just thought I'd throw that out. Lion Brown. Lion Brown, OK. Sports. After the game, tap it in. I can see a couple, so two children at the present moment around his feet. Um, I think there might have been another one um, also, but he's... It, it, I can only see two, but I, I'm, going to, I'm getting another one sort of hidden behind him, like um, quite shy or something. Um, there must have been a girl. Doesn't want to be known. Um, can't handle or deal with what's happened to, his fa to the father. Kevin had fathered three biological children. Hayley, his daughter with Leanne, was just two when he died and has found it hard to cope with his murder. Kevin adored Hayley and Leanne's other two children from her previous marriage. I don't feel that he saw his kids all that often and he wanted to see them. So there was quite a bit of tension about all that in, here, in the family life or something here with his, with his wife, um, estranged wife. I think his kids were taken away from him. I think he was heartbroken all around because he screwed up, big time. 10 weeks before he died, Kevin split up with his partner, Leanne. What about your wife? It's not Linda. Lisa? There's the L, he's making me play the guess game and I don't want a guess game, but he says the L is a significant thing. He's going. <laughs> Lindy? Linda. The L's just significant. I'm sorry, I don't understand why. I'm asking him, but he's just looking at me. Leanne or something. Leanne. I went through a really hard time fighting arguments. The whole bit. Yeah. Can I see a photo? Deb looks at Kevin's photo for the first time. Really? When I get the vision, I've got longer hair, like out the side here, than... It doesn't... I suppose he's got wave. You can't really tell with the photo but there's slight wave in his hair, yeah, and the tan skin. <laughs> Lister, I'm going to look at the photo, I think. OK, here's that smile. <laughs> he just keeps pointing at me. His name's Calvin. Oh, he's got the K-E... Go e Kelly. I'm just trying, I'm trying to guess here. He's just going... OK, stop hitting me. <laughs> K-E. And the same name keeps rolling over my head. Um, starts with a K. <sighs> Kevin? Kevin. He keeps... Kevin. He said call me Kev. <gasps> Kev. Kevin. Got him. Hey, got him, right? Kev. He just said, change the L around. <laughs> he just called me a dummy. Thanks, mate. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> Don't put that to you. 
It keeps giving me a lot of manual work here because um, I see the physical bodies moving. There seems to be a lot of noise around it as well. So he's a manual worker outdoors. Chop, chop. Wood chop chips. Wood chips. What is that? Because I've got um, pieces of wood stacking up. Um, and I can see, like, the sawdust from the, and the, the wood. So he's a builder. Oh, I, just, I said, can you build? He goes, yeah. Do you like building? No. Kevin had dreamed of becoming a mechanic, but became a builder to please his mum. He's showing me the water. I don't know what the water is, but anyway, um, he said I'm, we're from the south, so he's from South New Zealand. New Zealand? Yeah, here. He keeps saying here. And he down, just points south, so he's from south further down. My her, <laughs> way down. So in the cargo, Dunedin. Down that far. Oh. This is lovely down there. Down there. <laughs> South. <laughs> I don't know what's down there. He wants me to go to a place called Tianao for some reason. I have never been there myself, but he's just said Tianao. Tianao is where Kevin was born and raised. When he died, Kevin's parents took his body home and buried him in a hillside cemetery next to his best mate, Trevor. The friend in the, the hometown, he's saying he's dead. Did he have a car accident? They used to have a good time together. They knew each other for a long time. Um, like little boy energy stuff happening here. Kev was devastated when he passed over. Um, apparently he must have died before Kev or something here. Or no, Kev was there to greet him when he passed over. So it's actually, yeah, I've got you. I've got Kev and then very soon, around that time, that's where I've got his friend going into spirit with him as well. It's a T, Trevor, Terry, one of them. <laughs> Is it Tre Trevor? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's going. <laughs> Deb has also picked up on Kevin's childhood friend Trevor, who died in a car accident just a few hours after Kevin was killed. He said, "What do you want to know about Trevor for anyway? He's got nothing to do with my murder." Next, the psychics ask the spirit of Kevin to take them back to that night when he was brutally murdered in a Nelson car park. He reckons he was pretty pissed. <laughs> Being a bit of a naughty boy, he's telling me. But he's but not bad naughty, just naughty naughty. Drowning his sorrows on a pub crawl in Nelson. It was a decision that would cost him his life. Now psychics Deb Weber and Kelvin Cruikshank return to that fateful night on May the 1st, 1993. Is that night, so... He must have been out like enjoying himself because I've got a lot of people, I've got drinking, I've got um, like nightclub pub atmosphere around him, having a great time, dancing around, there's people dancing, I can see girls and guys and everything else. I'm at a club of some sort, um, there's, a, there's a club that he's there, he's, he's had a few drinks, he's talking about dancing, he wants to show me his feet, he wants to talk about how clever at dancing he was. He's saying that he was pretty much out on his own, really, so he was having a good time, though. And um, being a bit of a naughty boy, he's telling me, but he's but not bad naughty, just naughty naughty. He reckons he was pretty pissed. <laughs> Excuse my language, but his alcohol level must have been extremely high. The psychics have correctly identified that Kevin was at a nightclub. He spent the last hour of his life at Horatio's in Central Nelson. He wasn't happy that day, in particular. He was trying to forget all sorts of things. I, mean, I feel like I've been told off in the pub. <laughs> I really do. I really feel like somebody's had a crack at me. <laughs> I'm really pissed off about it. And he left the nightclub to actually go home. Um, but he was... I think he was taking the right way home. I felt, first off, when I looked out, I thought he was taking a bit of a detour. Um, but still, I'm heading to home, my vision's, I'm going over there, that's my home. Kevin was seen leaving Horatio's nightclub at 10 to 3 in the morning. I'm standing outside the, you're safe, you're safe Kev, it's all right. Take me right through it. Standing outside the doors of the pub. Okay, drunken, staggering, had a few drinks, feeling a bit really easy going at the moment, having a good time, talking to myself while I'm walking up the road. I'm in the car park, I'm walking through the cars. The really interesting thing is I want to focus on the people who did it. And I thought originally maybe there's just one, but 
The more I put my head to it, I'm thinking that there's two. Significantly, police also believe that Kevin was murdered by more than one person. I don't know why, but there must be a doorway or something around the corner there, because I feel whoever it was was near the doorway. It was just in that area. They look just like normal shops to me. Windows, I see lots of windows, so... Well, there must have been a Dick Smith's or something there, because I keep um, get, getting the image of the name, the Dick Smith's, Dick Smith. Dick Smith is an Australasian chain of electronics stores. Deb has picked up that Kevin was killed outside the Nelson branch. He just said, I bloody well knew. You know, that feeling of feeling something's going to happen, but you're too pissed to know. <laughs> Car park. Car park. Oh, don't swear at me, mate. In the car park. Oh, bless him. Kevin was ambushed just as he was leaving the Montgomery Street car park. He's dropping. Every time I look at him, he falls down, like onto the footpath or onto the ground. Um, it just keeps collapsing on me at the moment. So, And it feels like he's hit, and I keep getting it from in behind me with the hitting side of things, and I've got pain going right down inside my neck, right on this side of my body at the moment. It feels like he was actually, I don't know if the beating was so severe that it felt like getting stabbed because it's like, you know, and I've just gone with the pain of the knife. Oh, he just gave me a bit of blood thing. Oh, okay. Oh, wonder if he's been penetrated. Oh, yeah. He's just showing me something going into his side. Oh, okay, gotcha. I think he got hit first, I think. Um, because the hit came in first earlier. Big dong on his head too. Big dong on his head, just crunched. He uses the word crunched. Um, so he might have hit heavily, hit the deck pretty hard. Kevin was struck in the head by a blunt instrument and stabbed six times in the back and chest. Because I keep feeling like semi-consciousness because of a hit, but I still get the stabbing. That's the part that killed him, the stabbing. But I think he was on the ground already. No, he must have got stabbed when he's still standing up because it was so quick for him. He said they knew where to go, they knew where to go. I'm gone, just like that. There was no coming back from that one. Like the first one got him. Police believe the killers knew exactly where to strike. One of the stab wounds pierced a major artery. I get hit, stabbed, and then I'm down on the ground. Um, but he's just, like, but he's not deceased. Like, I'm not getting him dead. I'm just getting him laying there, like, <sighs> trying to hold on, trying to, um, like, call out, reach out, um, trying to move, staggering sort of feeling, you know, just um, moving his body and he's dragging it, but he's, he's, um, he's saying to me he's trying to get help, so he's trying to move and he's collapsing as he's moving and <clears throat> down. And all he's thinking about is how sorry he is for everything that he's done. As he's doing it, he's just getting weaker and weaker. And just can't move now. The psychics have described Kevin's dying moments with uncanny accuracy. Next, they attempt to close in on his killers. It's not an older person, not more than, nowhere near more than 23, 24. I can see sneakers and I can see jeans. Builder Kevin O'Loughlin was an average Kiwi bloke who loved rugby, beer and the great outdoors. He was strong and fit and could defend himself in a fight. But Kevin was no match for the vicious killers who stabbed him to death in a Nelson car park in 1993. Psychics Deb Webber and Kelvin Cruikshank are investigating Kevin's unsolved murder. Armed with only a photograph, the psychics have identified key points about his life and death. Now they ask the spirit of Kevin to give them clues that will help catch his killers. Hey! Oh no, let's go! Yeah, let's fucking go right now, boy! Fucking go out the fucking pub! He had enemies. You know, he'd provoke it. He'd provoke people, he'd push people. And they'd just get pissed off with him. Everybody knows everybody. This links everybody, everybody, everybody. They all knew each other. He's had a fight with quite a number of people, so it's like, well, which one do you want to pick that wants to get him? I can only do what, he's, what I'm feeling. 
He just said The person who killed him knew exactly where to hit or put the weapon. Multiple stab wounds, we could see it. They probably come through his back, straight into his heart from behind. They knew exactly the one spot to hit. So the killer has army connections. A person who is at, at knowing exactly which way to point the, the, the weapon is in killing. And the thing is, this killer just killed him. He didn't take anything. So it was, you know, you don't walk out in the street and just kill someone for no reason at all. Police ruled out robbery as a motive because Kevin's wallet was still on his body. What I'm picking up here is just this person that didn't like what he did, didn't like Kevin being mean how he was, didn't like him in the nightclubs, you know, um, the ego thing. Like, you know, Kevin was pretty confident in himself. He says, who did I betray? And this is a big question that I'm asking him too. Who did you betray? Because you have betrayed somebody. It feels it, when it initially happened, he thought it might have had something to do with his ex-wife. Then he thought, no, nah, it couldn't be that. Um, He's asking if it was about drugs. So, you know, we'll kick next sort of into drug area. So I just asked him if he was into drugs himself. He says, no, didn't do drugs, but there's a link to drugs. And he says, go younger, go tennis. Oh, go, he goes at tennis wall again. So that's a sports connection as well. Okay, Kev went down pretty quick. I've just got to get him to look up at the face because he went down so fast that he's just... From behind, it uh, seems like a youth, a young person has taken him out. Uh, it's not an older person, not more than, nowhere near more than 23, 24. I'd say like mid-20s sort of um, age group. He's got a dark jacket on. He's um, about an inch, two inches shorter than what Kev is. He's got... Um, uh, he feels like he's, he looks like he's actually got quite thin legs, but he's quite big up the top area of his body, so he's quite solid. Yeah, he's just as though you took me, so that's going to be really interesting to track. Emphasis on track, track shoes. This guy ran on foot, had sneakers on, by the way. I can see sneakers and I can see jeans. We know who it is. We have an inkling. Everybody sort of seemingly knows. The police actually know who this person is. So he might be known to actually steal a car or two. Feels like, OK, uh, you know, it feels like he's, like, but must be known by the police or something anyway. The psychics seem to be honing in on one of the killers. They push to see if Kevin Spirit can name him. The man that killed you, what's his name? Straight through, just tell me what his name is. I'm going to go throw out a few names here that are significant from his point of view. He just said... For the first time on Sensing Murder, the psychics have come up with the same name in connection with the killer. The name is unusual and so, for legal reasons, has been obscured. Now the psychics ask Kevin Spirit for other names significant to the case. It's interesting because I keep getting the word and I, keep, and I got the name of Brian in that. He's also given me beef for Bruce. Be for Barry, I don't know, but he just says there's a big B involved. This time, both psychics have come up with a name starting with B. <laughs> Deb provides a first and second name for the man. The psychics now ask Kevin's spirit to help them track his killers. Where is he going? Kev, you have to follow him. Go with him. Sneakers, I can see sneakers. Follow the sneakers then. He was running, he, there was a car involved, but it was up around the corner. It wasn't actually near where Kevin was. It actually looks like a ute to me. OK, he's just showing me fishing boats. He's showing me fish, fish, fish everywhere. Something to do, there's a symbol or something on this car. Looks like a C with a circle around it or something. It's interesting because it feels like a, a work car or something. his killer, because he keeps showing me the male figure coming in now from behind, um, is related to, related to the person who had a fling with, if he had a fling, that is. He dropped his head again, so he must have, he must have been some sort of outwardly skullduggery. He's showing that 
the person, female, that he had a fling with, partner, brother type scenario. Can you see the picture for me? That person's taken it upon themselves to do their brother a favour. I think there might have been some anger issues between Kev and the brother, like full on. And there was this, just this clashing thing happening. Uh, and then they must have seen each other in the nightclub or something here or out that night before the stabbing actually occurred, but hours prior. We talked about him maybe being promiscuous and having a little bit of a fling perhaps and obviously being caught by the sounds of it from what I'm feeling. So the police, for an example, would have to look at back at that suspect because he probably is the lead suspect, the boyfriend of the said girlfriend who, he, who Kevin had the affair with. Many psychics use psychometry to channel information from objects. Deb is given Kevin's wallet. Protective gloves will stop her fingerprints contaminating potential evidence. Can you smell dust? Mm. Um, uh, it's like you know they can't breathe because it's really dusty. It's not the wallet, is it? Oh, what is that? It's really strong, like um, dirt. Lots of dry dirt dust. God, it's so strong. Oh, it's even stronger when I open the wallets. Strangely, the production team can't smell dust. The odour leads Deb to make a significant revelation. They're looking for the weapon still, so um, it's got something to do with the weapon and dusty old factory type. The knife used to kill Kevin has never been found. Something about rubbish again. Dirt, dirty job rubbish. Um, tip or um, um, garbo. Just out of town a little bit. Um, sort of like on the edge of Nelson. C-A-R-L-S-E-N, Carlson. Deb asks for a map to help her hone in on the location of the murder weapon. He still keeps taking me just out of town, just out here, just out here to do with something to do with the industrial area or whatever it is. Deb is pointing to an industrial area in the suburb of Richmond, which is a 10 minute drive from Nelson City. So he knows the area, the industrial area, the killer does. He used to work there or have a job there. Oh, dirt, dirt, a, 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 a soil place, you know, like mounds of dirt. They call that, I don't know what they call that sort of place. Next, Deb continues her hunt for the knife and the psychics retrace Kevin's final footsteps. And I just get to here and I get, boom. <sighs> Yuck. Like, like I'm standing in a pool of it, it feels like. like... Some paranormal researchers believe that murder victims leave behind an emotional imprint where they were killed. Psychics Kelvin Cruikshank and Deb Webber are taken to the Nelson car park where Kevin O'Loughlin died in an attempt to uncover more clues about his unsolved murder. Um, here somewhere. Neither psychic has visited Nelson before. They are challenged to retrace Kevin's last journey. Come on, mate, show me where I'm just shaking like a leaf. I'm absolutely really frightened. I'm not frightened for my own safety, I'm frightened for... Kev's frightened. This area here is significant. He might have staggered through that way. He was cutting, he was cutting through, I think, when it happened, because he's going over there. Unprompted by the production team, the psychics are following the exact route that Kevin took through the car park. So we're coming up to where it happened, up in here, because he's um, stopping me, but he's, he knows it's in here. So... Hard, man. That's all right, I'm just fully, I'm feeling him, just asking him. Oh, I feel sick. Oh, I feel really sick. Um, It happened along, it must have been just along in here, but it happened. Um... 
keeps going on. I'm feeling like the rugby thing keeps coming back in. The sports thing keeps coming back in, and I'm looking at that sports bar there. Uh, and I'm somehow crossed up between coming through, staggering. Oh, show me, man. The sports bar that Kelvin is drawn to used to be Dick Smith Electronics, the shop where Kevin was stabbed. He's actually showing me blood. Where am I, Kevin? I think it was maybe over there where it happened because he's just saying, let's not go there, OK? Deb is heading straight for the former electronic shop. Oh, now I feel really, really sick. <laughs> <laughs> He's saying a bit further. Oh, I don't want to go further. <laughs> I don't want to go further. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> what happened? It's here. Here. <laughs> here. Oh, yuck. And blood. <laughs> Everywhere. Like here. Like... Like, I'm standing in a pool of it, it feels like. Deb is standing in the precise spot where Kevin's body was found. In the, in the reading, we were talking about tennis players and stuff. Go tennis. Oh, go, he goes at tennis ball again. And tennis balls. And tennis rackets. Uh, sports and all sorts. Psychics follow signs and synchronicities. A seemingly irrelevant image can be meaningful. In this case, a vision of a tennis ball has led Kelvin straight to the spot where Kevin was first stabbed. Like that, and the bash to, to, to the neck that I got could have been not me facing that way, but him facing that way from hitting the wall, turning his head. Kelvin is directly in front of the wall where police found <sighs> blood smears. So they've done that to him. I can't pinpoint where he's fallen over, though. Show me where you dropped. I must be pretty close here. I must be really close. I, I feel like I'm going like that, and I just get to here and I get boom. Yeah, I want to go here, right here. It's a quite emotional. Here. Police think Kevin was dealt the first blow here before staggering to the front of the shop on the main road where Deb now stands. Visions of the murder are proving too much for Deb. Deb asks to leave the murder site. She wants to hunt for the weapon and asks to be driven to the industrial area in Richmond that she identified on the map during her reading. I think the murder has got something to do with the, the place, the, where I got that scent, the smell and everything. Either they got rid of the knife there or, yeah, it's like it disposed of it. Before she even saw a map, Deb named a street she thought was significant to the case. Coincidentally, as she approaches the industrial area, there is a street with a similar name. C-A-R-L-S-E-E. Place, Carlson. Well, I feel sick again now. Ugh. Mounds of dirt. Where's the dirt? Because I smelt dirt, like dirt, and there was an area out the back and it had dirt. Yeah, and I feel sick, really sick. He's saying this is the place. Yeah, so I think the fellow either worked in this area or he disposed of. I think they should actually check every worker in this area just around in here. Young guy, mid-20s, 24. Bit of an attitude, skinny legs, solid body, tattoos on one arm. It's really short hair, like, oh, um, really short, like even shaven short. The ute, the white ute with the logo on it, the C. 
Oh my god, I'm gonna. No, I don't want to get out. I don't want to get out. I don't think we can be here. This is a bit freaky. The whole lot. It's all here. Deb is overwhelmed. She wants to distance herself from the site and takes the crew to view it from afar. Dirt. It's like a mixture because it's not it's not just dust. It's a mixture of dust and and it gets into your nostril and your mouth and into your throat and it's just can't breathe. I think it'd be absolutely impossible to find the knife now. Absolutely, it just because it's gone. But I think the person had something to do with Kev's death, worked in this area, because he knew the area. He knew where to put it, you know, get rid of it. Yeah, and that's what I think happened. Mm. That's freezing. <laughs> Next, a team of investigators unearth some intriguing information when they follow up the psychic's leads. The recycling depot didn't exist when Kevin was murdered. But interestingly, the site is adjacent to a disused rubbish tip. By tuning into the spirit of Kevin O'Loughlin, psychics Kelvin Cruikshank and Deb Webber have come up with new insights that may be relevant to the murder inquiry. Former detective Duncan Holland heads a team of investigators. Using conventional methods, they have researched the psychics' findings with the aim of producing some cold, hard facts. My team has investigated the psychics' leads and believe they've come up with some key information that may assist police investigating the unsolved murder of Kevin O'Loughlin. Mate! Oh, no, let's go! Yeah, let's fucking go right now, boy! Fucking go out the fucking pub! He had enemies. You know, he'd provoke it. He'd provoke people. He'd push people. And they'd just get pissed off with him. Everybody knows everybody. There's links. Everybody, everybody, everybody. They all knew each other. He's had a fight with quite a number of people, so it's like, well, which one do you want to pick that wants to get him? The police are convinced that more than one person murdered Kevin, but due to a lack of evidence, they have been unable so far to establish a clear motive. The psychics have correctly identified a number of issues in Kevin's life that could present potential motives. It is possible that the different attackers each had their own reasons for wanting Kevin out of the way. We examined the various motives to see what could have provoked his death. Definitely, ladies' men. That is for certain. He's telling me he did all right in that department. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, he's, um... <laughs> well, he's flirtatious, that's for sure. We talked about him maybe being promiscuous and having a little bit of a fling, perhaps, and obviously being caught by the sounds of it, from what I'm feeling. Our investigations have revealed that after separating from Leanne, Kevin had several one-night stands. There was speculation that he'd planned to go out with a married woman the night of the attack, but her husband found out. Close associates also revealed Kevin had interfered in a friend's marriage, revealing the infidelity of one of the partners. His actions caused both marriages to break up. He's showing that the person, female, that he had a fling with partner, brother type scenario. Can you see the picture for me? I think there might have been some anger issues between Kev and the brother, like full on. Significantly, police did explore a number of scenarios involving brothers. Police questioned the brother of a woman Kevin had been in a relationship with. Sources claimed he was planning to sort Kevin out after discovering Kevin had been violent toward his sister. There's something there going on with the brother anyway because he didn't like Kev at all for what he did. He's just showing me fishing boats. He's showing me fish, fish, fish. Interestingly, our investigators found another possible scenario involving brothers who were fishermen. The brothers were known to police and one was later sentenced to life for murdering another man. On the night of Kevin's murder, this brother was at sea, but his girlfriend and brother saw Kevin out on the town. Our research suggests that the man's girlfriend may have been attracted to Kevin. His brother left a bar near the murder scene shortly before Kevin was killed. That person's taken it upon themselves to do their brother a favour. Tattoos on one arm. Really short hair, like, um, really short, like even shaven short. They just said 
The psychics described and named an associate of the brothers who had also been in town that night. He separated from his friends several hours before the murder and his whereabouts at the time of the murder are not known. We know who it is. We have an inkling. Everybody sort of seemingly knows. The police actually know who this person is. He might be known to actually steal a car or two. It feels like, okay, uh, you know, it feels like he's, like, but must be known by the police or something anyway. The associate came to police attention for hot wiring a car on the night of the murder and had recently been released from jail. It's interesting because I keep getting the word Significantly, both psychics came up with the same unusual name in connection with one of the killers. A man with this middle name claimed to have sold Kevin cannabis on the night of the murder. So I just asked him if he was into drugs himself. He says no, didn't do drugs, but there's a link to drugs. He's asking if it was about drugs, so, you know, we'll connect sort of into drug area. Kevin's friends and family say he was anti-drugs and police could find no evidence to suggest he was taking or dealing drugs. And I've got the name of Brian in that. The other name. Deb Weber also came up with a full name in connection with the killers. So the killer has army connections. A person who is at, at knowing exactly which way to point the, the, the weapon is in killing. We have found a soldier with the full name suggested by Deb who lived in a North Island army camp. For privacy reasons, we have been unable to establish whether he was on leave or in the Nelson area at the time of the murder. However, these details will be available to police. Can you smell dust? Oh, dirt, dirt. A, 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 a soil place? Tip or a, a garbo. Yeah, they got rid of the knife there or, yeah, they could dispose of it. By following psychic signs, Deb led the crew to an area currently occupied by a recycling operation. I think that's why I keep getting the smell of dust and dirt around me as well, because it was really strong with connected to the fella. The recycling depot didn't exist when Kevin was murdered, but interestingly, the site is adjacent to a disused rubbish tip. If the murder weapon had been hidden in this type of wasteland, it would be extremely difficult to find. Oh, I think it'd be absolutely impossible to find the knife now. Absolutely, it just, because it's gone. The New Zealand police deal in factual evidence, but are open to all sources of information. The psychics have revealed potential lines of inquiry that we believe could warrant further investigation in the hunt for Kevin O'Loughlin's killers. If you have any information about Kevin's murder, please contact Detective Senior Sergeant Wayne McCoy at Nelson Police on 03 546 3893. If you have any information relating to the psychic's findings, please log on to tvnz.co.nz and enter the keyword sensing. I think that there's people out there who know who the offender is, who may have been present at the time, who, who wasn't the, actually the person that stabbed him. I believe it's time for them to come forward to tell us about it, to help the family know what happened, and for Kevin's family's sake. Kevin's parents, Elsie and Terry, relive the murder every time they visit their son's final resting place. I used to be up here every week for a long time, you know. But I felt like with Terence bringing me up, I wanted to be here by myself because I wanted to scream. Well, when I go walking in Tiana, I do that now. When I go for the long walks down the lake, I wail to myself. Just all I feel like doing frustration and cause missing him. But, uh... Kevin's former partner Leanne and their daughter Hayley will be haunted by the murder until Kevin's killers are behind bars. Somebody's walking around, they've taken somebody else's life and they're walking around scot-free. And there needs to be some sort of justice. There needs to be, somebody needs to be made accountable for their actions. I just have so many bad feelings towards the person that did it because they took my father away from me. I never got to know him. And 
we've never found the person and if they did find the person then I'd just have that closure and I could feel better inside as well knowing that they were away they were locked away for something that they did For the twinkle in his eye. The brutal murder of a gentleman shocked the country. I won't call them people because they're not people to do this to another person. They're animals. Now, 27 years on, he's got kind eyes. He's fighting back. <laughs> Are you ready to believe? I just got something from that. That's just trying to tell me something. Let's <laughs> get everyone in the room. <laughs> Sensing murder. Next week, TV2. With TVNZ tonight for least 10-7.